Thank you very much for your introduction. It's, it's, uh, it's a, quite an honor for me to enjoy the hospitality of this most, most uh, renowned of institutions. Uh, and I hope I can live up to the standards of this environment. Um, so this is the ninth lecture in, uh, in, in this series. And um, I want to give a, a bit of a double introduction. On the one hand, an introduction for those of you who have witnessed the previous eight talks, and then uh, an introduction for those who have not. Um, for those who have not, let me start with, with the newcomers. Uh, for those who have not, what we have been doing in, in the previous talks is to have a look at the importance of social variation, and that's a very broad concept that includes cultural variation and also to some extent historical variation. So we've been having a look at the importance of social variation for cognitive studies. Now cognitive linguistic studies are to a large extent involved with meaning. Meaning is what they concentrate on. So some of the things that I have been doing in the previous talks is to have a look at the way in which lectal structure, I'll say a word about that in a moment, the way in which lectal structure correlates with meaning variation. Meaning variation we can study from a polysemy point of view, from a semasiological point of view as I called it, starting from a category, uh, from a word and looking at its meanings, but we can also study it from uh, the other perspective when it comes down to choosing different categories all choosing different words for expressing the same category. That's what we've been calling onomasiological variation. Um, so from that point of view, what we've been doing is to see in what extent, and in, in, in which ways, and there's a double way in a sense, social variation is meaningful. It's meaningful because meaning itself varies, but it's also meaningful because different social categories um, ex express certain meanings, express group identity or whatever it could be. Um, yes, I still have to add something about this word lectal structure that I used. Lectal, that's the cover term. Remember that it's the cover term that I used to refer to all forms of, all forms of dialects, sociolects, regiolects, but also registers, stylistic forms, and so on. So that's lectal variation. Now, where we have come uh, at this point is that we can now start uh, looking at um, some of the more intricate questions that have to do with this set of problems. Now, we've looked at variation of meaning from a social perspective, variation of categorization of a social perspective, variation of lexical choice from a social perspective. And we've looked at those things separately. But there is a bit of a problem, because the problem is, um, if you think back, so I'm now, in a sense, starting the introduction for those who've witnessed uh, the, the previous talks. Yesterday, and, and um, well, in, in the two talks yesterday, we looked at the, at the variation that can exist among referential synonyms, right? Words like subway and underground that basically have the same denotational meaning, but they do have a different social meaning because they belong to different lects. The subway underground is a simple example that would be American English and British English. But the precondition for doing that is that we can establish clear synonymy on the denotational level. And in the case like subway and underground, we're probably willing to accept that that is, uh, um, that that is the case, that we have a clear case of synonymy there. But it's not always so easy. And in a number of cases, um, it can take us a, a, a long way to try to establish exactly if there is real synonymy. And I should mention as, in a sense, a form of, of nuance with regard to the method that I've been presenting the previous days, this method of, of, of measuring distances on the basis of lect lect lexical choices, uh, I should also mention that the method may not always be applicable precisely. That was a problem that also came up in the discussion uh, after uh, the last talk yesterday. Um, it's also uh, it's, it's a method that may not always be applicable because the synonymy, the, the strict synonymy that is a requirement for the application of the method is not always there. And um, 
This gives me also an opportunity to mention that this is one of the basic things that we are working on at the moment in, in our research group. How can, we, how can we have a look at forms that are at the same time sociolinguistically, lectally variable and at the same time semantically variable? When the situation is less clear than in the football terms and the clothing terms that we looked at before, how do we deal with the variation? And, well, we're working on that. I'm not going to present that. I think I've said before that what I'm presenting is not, uh, is, is not a finished product. It's, it's, it's a line of thought and a line of research that is developing. I also want to add at this point that, uh, as, as you may have noticed, we have been moving towards more and more technical approaches, approaches that require... Uh, good material, lots of corpus material, or materials that have otherwise been collected, and appropriate techniques for analyzing those, uh, those materials. And as you saw yesterday, it sometimes gets fairly complicated with what we can do. That, that has a consequence, and I do want to say something about that. It's a consequence uh, of the kind, don't try to do this at home. That is to say, if you want to do this sort of analysis, and you want to do it in a proper way, it's not something that you on your own can sit down for and just do. You need, as, as is, is traditionally the case in sociolinguistics, for instance, you need a certain acquaintance with the appropriate techniques. And that will require training and, and learning how to do it. And I'm, these lectures are not meant for learning how to do it. That's not what you can do in this set of, set of textures. Lectures, textures, lectures. So, but if, if at any one point is any one of you who would think, oh, a study of lexical distances or lectal distances in, in, in Chinese for the Chinese languages or dialects or whatever, that might be interesting for me. And if you want to know more about the techniques we use and how to use them, uh, please contact me. The email address is at, at is, I think it's the very last slide of the, uh, of the handout. So, you can always find me if, uh, if you're interested. Okay, the background for the... the so what I'm doing today is um, to have a look at a more refined way of trying to establish complete synonymy. And that will lead us to, on the one hand, to the use of, again, a set of specific techniques quantitative techniques. On the other hand, also to a certain model of what a, 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 a linguistic description, a grammar if you wish, but let's say more neutrally a linguistic description, could look like from this perspective. That's what I um, hint at in the title of the talk as a multivariate model of linguistic variation. A multivariate in what sense? Well, in the sense that the choice the selection of a certain linguistic form will be determined at the same time, simultaneously, by factors of different kinds, by the meaning you want to express, but also by the context in which you are talking or speaking or writing, and uh, the overall lectal background of the, um, uh, of the forms in question. So what we have uh, for today is a case study on the question, do the two causative auxiliaries that we find in, well, Dutch again, okay. It's always, it's always good to do linguistics on exotic languages, languages that for you are exotic. So Dutch is an exotic language for you. Uh, that creates distance. It may also create a, a bit of a difficulty, but creates a certain distance and it gives you a critical attitude. So let's again have a look at Dutch. Um, so Dutch has two causative auxiliaries, auxiliaries with which you can express a causative meaning. It has a doen auxiliary and a laten auxiliary. And it's, it's slightly like make and let in English. It's not exactly the case, but it's more or less like that, to give you a first approximation. So the question will be, um, do these... Uh, causative auxiliaries express the same meaning? Do they just express causation in general? They probably don't. But then if they do not, 
what exactly is the difference between them? So see how we are moving from uh, a method where we measure lectal differences on the basis of lexical variation with strict synonyms to a study where we will look at the differences, semantic and other differences, between near synonyms. Okay. Um, so this is what I've also already said. In our treatment of formal onomasiological variation, we've assumed that synonymy semantic equivalence is, is easy to establish, but what method could we follow to establish whether that is indeed the case? So we'll zoom in on near synonyms to study the extent of their, there's a typo there, um, of their semantic equivalence and the role played by lectal factors in distinguishing between those items. So, um, let me now first introduce uh, the, uh, the question a bit further. I've already said that we are looking at the alternation or the differences between doen and laten in Dutch. And, um, well, I've, I've already told you about Belgian Dutch and Netherlandic Dutch. At some points in this talk, uh, in the handout, you, you may see that I'm referring to Flemish. Well, Flemish is shorthand for Belgian Dutch because it's spoken in Flanders as a region. As I've already, uh, as I've also explained, lectal variation is also kind of shorthand. Uh, it, it involves all kinds of dialectal, regiolectal, idiolectal, sociolectal, and so on variation. Now, there have been other people who've been talking about the um, the differences between Doen and Laten, um, specifically Suzanne Kemmer and Ari Verhagen. And at one point, they put forward a hypothesis that the choice for Laten is determined by what they call indirect causation. So they make a distinction between direct causation and indirect causation, and then assume that uh, indirect causation is predominantly expressed by Laten. So that is their idea of the um, semantic difference. It's, in this case, it's a purely semantic difference between the two verbs. Now, what does that involve? Um, oh yes, I should mention, and, and that's the formulation that I will use as a starting point. This idea of indirect causation has been further developed in a PhD thesis by uh, Ninka Stücker in 2006. And what Stucker says is something like this in the case of direct causation. The causa produces the affected event directly. There is no intervening energy uh, source downstream. Okay, okay this, is, this may be a bit difficult to, 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 to understand, but this refers to a certain model of causation where causation, in, 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 and this refers to theories of Lentolmi, where causation is seen in terms of a flow of energy, a flow of energy from a source to a target. And um, in this case, what, what they mean by uh, direct causation is that the, the, the flow of energy from source to target is relatively direct. There's nothing in between that helps as a, as a transmitter of, uh, of, of the causation. And indirect causation, on the other hand, um, they say that beside the causa, the causi is the most intermediate source of energy in the affected event. The, cause, the causi has some degree of autonomy in the causal process. Now, what does that, uh, what does that refer to? Well, um, they have a specific terminology here. So let's, take, let's perhaps take uh, an example. The policeman made the car stop. Then the policeman is the causer, the car is the causey, and the stopping is the effected event. Okay. That's the terminology they use. Now notice that you can also, so in this case, you have an intransitive complement, stop. There's another case where you can have a construction with a transitive complement. The policeman made the car driver stop the car. Okay. 
or made the driver stop the car. And in such a case, um, the intermediate entity, the core Z, can be seen as an intermediate source of energy. Now, in the conception, so in that case, when the core Z, the intermediate entity, has a role in the causative process, then we would have indirect causation. And when the core Z does not have such an, uh, a role, then there's direct causation. So that is ultimately a semantic hypothesis about the role of the core Z, the, the, the way the energy flows and the role that the core Z plays in that energy. Now, obviously, when you, when you would try to test this hypothesis, notice that this is something that can be tested as a hypothesis. You have a clear idea or a clear formulation of what it is that influences the presence of Dune or Laten. Dune in the case of direct causation, Laten in the case of indirect causation. Fine. But how, do, how, will you, how will you go about testing it? Because the difference between the two, the two constructions or the two interpretations, whatever you want to call them, is, is not just linked. I introduced it that way, but it's certainly not linked to the difference between having a transitive or an intransitive complement clause. That, that's, not, um, that's not really what, what, what distinguishes it. It is a semantic thing, and it has to do with the role of the cause E. So how are you going to establish that? Um, a, a traditional way of doing it uh, in linguistics would probably be to, uh, to sit down and to read, maybe you have them from a corpus, to read or think up a number of sentences that exhibit the, uh, either the Dun verb or the Latin verb, and then establish for yourself intuitively, introspectively, Okay, I feel that this is indirect causation and I feel that this is direct causation. According to me, it's this. That's, of course, from a methodological point of view, a fairly weak approach. Because what are your criteria for saying that it is so and so? If you can spell out the criteria and if everybody else could follow them, then we've, we have a further step. Then we can say, okay, now we can perhaps do a survey and ask a hundred of people, whether it's this or whether it's that, and see how good, uh, how, how, how much uh, inter-rater comparability we have, how much agreement we have, and then we're getting closer to a, to a more objective methodology. There's also another way, and, and that's what I took to get at the more objective methodology, and that's what I will try to illustrate here, and that's to look into a corpus, and think about the phenomena in the corpus that might correlate with one of the interpretations or with the other. So instead of just looking at the sentences and trying to understand what we feel, well, what we understand, trying to pin down how our understanding is of the sentence, of this subtle difference between um, indirect causation and, and direct causation. Instead of doing that, we go to the corpus and we code the sentences that we find for a number of features. Features of which we assume on the basis of the, of the, theoretical, um, of, of the theoretical approach that we have, of the theoretical analysis, that they would correlate either with indirect causation or direct causation. So, um, this is something that we know about. So what we need then is if we follow this approach. So as, as I say, we could maybe also do this with a kind of, of questionnaire research. What we do want to avoid is pure subjectivity. Okay? So what we need is a representative corpus of language data, a set of potentially relevant factors coded in the corpus, and a statistical technique analyzing the relevance of the corpus. So let me go through this. What in this case study are the various um, steps here? Well, the corpus that I'm using for this case study is the so-called um, corpus of spoken Dutch, which is for a spoken corpus fairly large. It's, it's 900 hours of tagged Dutch material. 
Two-thirds of it is Netherlandic Dutch and one-third is Belgian Dutch or Flemish. It includes quite a bit of register and text type variation, so it's interesting from a sociolinguistic point of view. And we used the um, corpus so to retrieve our Dune and Latin sentences. We used the corpus, we, we automatically retrieved Dune and Latin, but then there is quite a bit of manual correction you have to do because there are a number of things that you want to throw out. There are, for instance, a number of Latin uh, sentences that, that have a totally different meaning. Um, there are also a few Dune sentences that have totally different meanings that are not causatives, so let me put it that way. So you do, you, you do need some, some man, well, manual filtering. That's also um, a, a remark you have to make. If, if you, you've, again, you've noticed that I'm, I've been going to, from the more traditional forms of semantic analysis, to the more technically, uh, technically supported kinds of, of analysis. Um, it's not, and, and what I want to say about that at this point is that it's, it, it doesn't only require a statistical background and good materials, so it, it may require a specific type of training, but it also requires time. Some people sometimes think that corpus linguistics is easy. Forget about it. It's, it's difficult. You have to spend a lot of time checking your corpus, checking your data, coding your data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not the easy way. Okay, you can you, you can leave this this room and you can leave the lectures tomorrow thinking it may be nice what he's been presenting us, but it's certainly not the easy way. I'm aware of that. I plead guilty. But I think we have to do this if we want to get a few steps ahead. Okay. Um, the, the, the second point then? Oh, no, the third point. Uh, let me do, first do the third point. That's a bit more easy. Uh, the statistical technique. Well, in this case, so yesterday we used the multiple linear analysis, uh, regress regression analysis. Today, I will be using a stepwise logistic regression analysis, which is a bit similar to the uh, um, analysis that we presented yesterday. Um, we're coming to that in a moment, well, in a moment, in, in a couple of moments. Uh, again, the, the, why, why we choose this technique is because uh, it's the same type of question as what we had yesterday. We're looking at the impact of a multitude of possibly relevant factors on observed variation. And we're trying to see which of the possibly interesting factors is statistically significant. Okay. And on the basis of the factors that are statistically significant, we can then try to come at a more traditional interpretation of what the meaning difference is between Dune and Latin. We'll see how it works. Uh, now then, the, the, the set of relevant factors. Um, for the sake of clarity, I'll make a distinction between external factors and internal factors. The external ones are the ones that have to do with the lectal variation. Okay. And all of this is wired in in the construction of the corpus of spoken Dutch, of the CGN. So, for instance, in the corpus of CG, CGN, we have traditional sociolinguistic factors like uh, speaker characteristics, gender, age, educational level. There is obviously regional or, if you wish, national variation, the distinction between Belgian Dutch and Netherlandic Dutch. And there is, quite interestingly, register variation because the uh, corpus of spoken Dutch is built up of 15 components, as they are called. So 15 subcorpora. And the subcorpora are... Um, in a sense, divided along three dimensions. So you have dialogues and multilogues versus monologues. You have private speech versus public speech. And you have spontaneous speech versus prepared speech. And these, these dimensions interact. So you get corpora or subcorpora with combinations of, of these dimensions. So. Um, the overview that you have here of the corpora. Uh, I've divided it in, in the distinction between spontaneous and 
prepared speech, because that will turn out to be fairly interesting for our question. So for instance, to, to just give you a brief example of what we have there, we have face-to-face -face conversations, we have interviews, we have spontaneous <laughs> telephone conversations, another set of spontaneous telephone conversa conversations, uh, simulated negotiations, then broadcast um, television debates, classroom lessons, lots of things. So on the basis of what we, what we know about these components, we can then add something to the interpretation of, of the variation that we find if there is indeed an effect of these, uh, um, of these factors. Right. The internal factors, so the external factors, have to do with the, the social, lectal structure of the, um, <coughs> of the, the phenomena, of the material. The internal factors, those are the factors that I situate at sentence level. Right? So what do we find and what would we expect also um, in, in the sentences? Now, I should mention that this, this study is to some extent still a pilot study. One, one of our PhD students is currently elaborating this into a, a full PhD. So this is not the final word on the Doon and Laven variation. And the factors that I'm mentioning here are not uh, all of the factors that you might want to include from a semantic or syntactic point of view. But the, the set of materials that, that we've coded here, so for this case study, is, has been coded for uh, a number of features. First, syntactic construction type. That is um, the idea, or, or that involves the idea. So in, in syntactic construction type, I'll, I'll share a few examples in a moment, but syntactic construction type basically is, uh, involves, for instance, this distinction between transitive and intransitive constructions, yeah, right? So the, the, if, is the affected event, as, as uh, Cameron Verhagen and Sucker would use it, would uh, name it, is the affected event of an intransitive or a transitive type. And what can our expectation be if we, if we start from the indirect causation hypothesis? Well, if Laten expresses indirect uh, causation, then you, you wouldn't expect Laten in intransitive constructions, because in the intransitive okay. constructions, um, there's no intermediate entity. There's the causa, and then there's the causi, but the causi does not mediate between the causer and a third party, because there is no third party, okay? Because you have an intransitive sentence. So um, in that sense, you could say, or you can formulate a hypothesis, if Lata expresses indirect causation, you don't expect it in intransitive constructions. Notice how this will work. If, if this is the case, this is a prediction that we get from the theory. Okay. And so what we will be doing is to test the prediction. We have a theory, and we think of something that might be a natural consequence of the theory, and then we see whether that consequence obtains or not. That's, that's the type of methodological process that is very important, that is crucial for this type of, of research. And up to a point, maybe understanding the methodological process is maybe more important in this case than actually understanding the details about the causatives. The, the message I want to, to, to bring is, this is a way in which we can make uh, semantic analysis a bit more objective than is traditionally the case. Okay. Where are we? Uh, a second factor is co-referentiality between the matrix subject and then the, either the, the, the subject or the object of the, uh, of the infinitive of the complement. So um, think about it in this way. If, if Dune expresses direct causation, then co-referentiality should favor the use of Dune. I, I made myself laugh. That's co-referentiality. Co um, it's difficult for me to imagine something that is more directly causative than, if, than when you influence yourself. 
So I'm tempted to say here on theoretical grounds, co-referentiality co should favor Dune because that's uh, an, a very direct form of influencing something when you influence yourself. Then the animacy of the matrix subject. If, if Dune expresses direct causation, you expect more Dune with animate matrix subjects because animate subjects have more control over the flow of energy. Okay, the, if, if you think of the wind as doing something, well, maybe the wind has a form of control, but only if you personify the wind. But if a heavy weight does something, causes something, you can't attribute agency to that heavy weight or not easily. It's much more easy to attribute agency to agents, to animate beings. And so um, it would seem that uh, Dune, direct causation, um, is more important with, or will occur more with, uh, with animate agents. I should say that here there is a bit of a, a, a gap in the coding. Uh, I think we should also have coded for the animacy of the cause of the other entity. But that's, not, that's one of the things that is still to be done, but that's not yet uh, included in this study. Then, then we have two uh, fairly complex um, Factors, factors that will require some extra um, explanation. I'll come to that in a moment. What are those factors? Well, collocational strength. Collocation, collocational strength. Why might that be important in this case? Well, you can, you can imagine that maybe the presence of Dune and Laten is not semantic, but is idiomatic. It, it might have something to do with fixed expressions, right? with fixed expressions where one verb always takes Latin regardless of the meaning of the total construction and where another verb always takes Dune regardless of the meaning of another verb. So, okay, you know that as a fixed expression. In itself, that's, that's not an, a novelty. But it means, of course, that if we have a semantic hypothesis about Dune and Latin, direct-indirect causation, then um, we should we would not expect that kind of fixed expression because the fixed expression is just formally fixed and it would not have a semantic background. At least that's what we would assume. So what we want to do is to filter or to see if, if there's any collocational effect where collocation in this case is the technical term for the, exist, the existence of fixedness between two items. So what we will need is a method for measuring that fixedness. I will come back to that in a moment. How, how do, we establish, do we establish whether something is a fixed expression or not? Whether the, the link between um, the, the causative auxiliary and the verb, the infinitival verb, whether that link is fixed or not? We will need a technique for doing that. And as we are doing quantitative corpus research, we will use a quantitative corpus technique for establishing that. There will be a, um, a nuance on this, so I'm distinguishing between lexical collocational strength and, sorry, and um, conceptual collocational strength. Well, let's first say, so in general, if the relevant factors are purely semantic ones, you don't expect collocational idiomatization or lexical fixation. And yeah, well, the conceptual collocational strength, let me try to explain that in a moment. Because I, if, if, for you to see what's happening there, I first have to explain how we measure lexical uh, fixation. Uh, these are a few uh, examples of the construction types that we have. So remember, that was the first factor and then also the second factor, co-reference co referentiality. Um, shall we go through this? Um, well, let me perhaps just take, take one example. This, this one, for instance. So what it says is, if I translate it, if I translate it literally in, in, into English, so if you can, if you can see in, in the table, it's a case of co-referentiality, and that you can see on the presence, presence of may 
that's like me in English. And it's of the pattern, the subject of the matrix sentence, subject of the, um, let's say, the core Z, you know, which is the subject of the embedded sentence, in a transitive construction, so you also have an object in the embedded sentence. And literally, what the construction says is I, and then you have the three dots for the auxiliary that you might choose. Iemand is someone, me is me, and verrassen is surprise. So, I let someone surprise me. There is a third party involved, someone, the cause E, and you are the, sub, are the object of the verb surprise. Someone surprises you, and you let that happen, or you make that happen. That, that would be the choice in English. You let it happen, or you make it happen and the person in question, question surprises you. So that's, uh, th that's the type of variation that, that you get. So we've, we've charted all these. So all these construction types are uh, included in the analysis. Okay, this is, um, as I mentioned, we have a few, of case, a few cases that we need to weed out. Um, Again, let me just give you one example of those, of the cases that we've thrown out. Those would be optatives, for, else, for instance, not causatives, but optatives, where you express, express a wish rather than a causation. Let us hope, in English, that's the second line there. Let us hope, that's not a causative, that's a wish, so that's not included in the uh, analysis. Okay. Now, before we go to the, actual, uh, to the actual analysis, something about this idea of collocation, collocations and collocational strength. Um, measuring collocational strength is a very, um, a very is, is, let's say it's almost a standard form of corpus analysis. It's, it's well established. And the general method that you use, or the general terminology that you use, is to distinguish a so-called node from a collocate. So the node is the element that you're interested in, which in this case could be, for instance, doen or laten. And the collocates are words that you find within a certain span, a certain distance in the text, um, away from your collocate. If you have a node and a collocate, you can distinguish between four situations. Those are the situations that are here mentioned in a summary fashion. So C together with N, that's when you find uh, a certain form C as a collocate of N. The C, for instance, could in this case be, uh, or in this case in, in the example that I gave a moment ago, uh, Surprise, verrassen. You, you, you would want to know if to, 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 to make or to let surprise, whether that is a fixed collocation or not. So, doen or laten would be the node, and um, surprise might be the, uh, uh, the C in this case, the collocate. It could also be the other way around, right? You could always also start from, from surprise and then see with what elements. Uh, whether doen or laten is a, is a collocate of surprise. That's also possible. But for, for uh, cases of illustration, let's say that uh, the auxiliary in this case is the node, and, and surprise is one of the C's that you have. So the first thing you can measure in the, con in the cor corpus is the number of times that surprise occurs in the environment of, of let's say, doen, to keep it simple. That's CN. Then you have not C, N. Those would be the occurrence of all other words except surprise in the neighborhood of Dune. Right? That's not C, N. Then you have C, not N. That's obviously the occurrence of surprise, the verb, verrassen, in the neighborhood of any other word except Dune. Right? And then you have all the rest. 
not C and not N. Any combination that is not Dune and that is not surprise. That's easy enough. That's just a question of distinguishing various collections, uh, combinations of, of, of words. Uh, maybe to avoid, uh, to, to avoid uh, misunderstanding, when we say in the neighborhood of, it, that could be in the direct neighborhood of, so to the left of the right, but of course when we say in the neighborhood of something within a span of ten words or five words, then it doesn't have to be in the immediate neighborhood. Right? Then there can be intermediate words. How you do this is part of the analysis that you decide on doing whether you take immediate, uh, immediate collocations to the left or the right or not, or whether you take a broader span, that's things that you can de those are things that you can determine in the course of the, uh, of the investigation. Right. Now, when we have that, how do we calculate collocational strength? Well, look at it this way. Um, when, when we have... C, N, not C, uh, N, C, not N, not C, not N, then we can calculate a number of ratios. Um, so we have the, the frequencies of C, N, and so on. And we can then compare the popularity of C as a collocate of N, as occurring in the, in the neighborhood of N, with the popularity of C as a collocate of anything else apart from N. And it's easy to calculate that if we take the ratio CN, first frequency, with regard to not CN, versus C not N uh, over not C not N. Those are the two ratios. Then we compare those two ratios, and we use a, a statistical test to see whether there is a significant difference between those two ratios. Okay? The, the, uh, the, the, the normal thing people would do here would, for instance, be to use a chi-square test to see whether there is a difference. These are, I mean, this is just to, to explain a fairly well-established method of collocational analysis to you. So that comparing the two ratios tells you whether C is more typical as a collocate of N than as a collocate of any other node. And the specific statistics that we use here, so the statistics that we use to... Uh, evaluate whether there is a, a statistically significant uh, collocational measure is the so-called log likely, likelihood ratio. Um, so this is the general schema that, that you can have for a collocational analysis. Um, So as I said, C, N, not C, N, C, not N, not C, not N. And then you take the relationship in the left-hand column, the proportion in the left-hand column, you take the proportion in the right-hand column, and you let the statistical program see whether the difference between the two is statistically significant or not. That's easy enough to understand, but... Uh, now we get another point, which is that, which are already hinted at. If you start with, with either Dun or Laten as your node, uh, you could fill out this schema in several ways. Uh, you, can, you can manipulate or, or vary, if you wish, the search domain, uh, so the search domain and the selection of contrast sets. So things we can do, for instance, and, and that's okay, that's where this difference will come in between lexical collocation and conceptual collocation. That's why I have to explain this. So lexical collocation is, is fairly uh, simple. That's what people would mostly do when they do collocational analysis. That is the question, how typical is a given verb as a collocate of doen in Flemish or Dutch, that is to say Belgian Dutch or Netherlandic Dutch, and analogously for Latin. So you fill it in in that way, you take the Dutch corpus, in, in this case, let's say the Netherlandic Dutch part of the corpus, and you fill out the overall schema that we had in this way. For your N, you take Doen, and then you take any other verb that it, com that it combines with, because we're interested in the combination with the verbs. You do the calculation. 
And then we would know, for instance, whether there is a fixed um, effect. Well, fixed effect is not a word. That's something else in, in statistics. Whether there is a, a, a collocational fixation of doon with that specific verb, the verb surprise, for instance. And we can do the same thing for the Flemish part of the, the Belgian-Dutch part of the corpus and see whether we have the same effect there. That's lexical collocation. Is the combination of a given verb and the auxiliary, is that a fixed expression or not? Well, somehow fixed expression, because that's the whole point, of course. Fixed expression, expressions come in degrees, degrees of being fixed. So that's what we are trying to measure. What's the degree of fixedness of the uh, of fixation of the combinations that we find? We can do that. So we can vary on that. You do it for Belgian Dutch. You do it for Netherlands Dutch. You do it for Doon. You do it for Latin. That gives us collocational strengths. Um, yeah, you can also do something else, but I'm not going to present that because it's not so important. That's, that's lexical distinctness. So you get lexical collocation and lexical distinctness. But I'll pass over this. And then you get conceptual collocation. And there you could ask the question, how typical is a given verb not just as a, a lexical combination of doen or laten, but as a verb that takes a causative, regardless of whether it is doen or laten. Right? So that's what I will be calling conceptual collocation. How typical are certain verbs for the causative construction as such, where the causative construction is determined by the presence of either doen or laten? And you can see that we can... We can um, implement that in the same schema if we say, okay, our node in this case is not doon alone or Latin alone, but it's either of both. So in a sense, you could, you could think of this as making a, a new corpus where all the instances of doon and Latin are collapsed in one new verb. Okay, the verb doon Latin. And then we ask the questions, what are the verbs that are typical for that construction? And does it, make, does it have an effect on the ultimate lexical choices that we have? Whether a verb is typically constructive, typ constructed, typically construed in a causative way. That's conceptual uh, collocation. So now we have all the factors. Yeah, this is not so important. So now we have all the factors. You have an idea of what we feed into the analysis. Now, what's the analysis going to do? Um, and which variants of the analysis do we use? So as I already said, and as you all also saw yesterday, um, a regression analysis constructs a statistical model that explains the variation in the data. So in our case, the, the variation is the choice for doon or laten. And in this case, we do a stepwise logistic regression, which means that we step by step, step the program, the statistical program, adds the factors that contribute most to the reduction of the variation. So it's like saying, if you look at the presence of doon or laten, the program can analyze for you which of these, these factors, let's, let's go back to the overall thing here, whether it is syntactic construction type that, that explains most of the variation, that correlates most highly with the, the choice of doon or laten. So the, fact, the, the program, in a sense, looks at the question, does the transitivity of the construction play a role in the choice of doon or laten? Does the co-referentiality play a role? Does the animacy of the subject play a role, play a role? and so on? That's what the program does, and the program then tells you, uh, yes, it does, or it doesn't, and it does to such and such an extent. Same thing as what we saw yesterday. Does familiarity play a role in the heterogeneity of uh, items? Does um, vagueness play a role in the heterogeneity of items? And so on. Okay, 
So what do we have, a look, uh, have to look at in, in, in the model, in the things we have? What are the factors that are retained in the model? What's the predictive accuracy? In what directions do the, model, do the factors work? Uh, also, in a stepwise regression, in what order are they added? And what, what are their significance values? And um, now I should also tell you that's, in a sense, a refinement on what we have. We didn't just do one regression analysis. Basically, we did three. We did one on the total materials, but then we also did a separate analysis on just the Belgian Dutch data and the Netherlandic Dutch data. But that's, that's not so difficult to understand. Okay, there are a few more nuances here, but I need, need not go uh, into, into those. Now, what are the results? Well, we, we have about almost 4,000 observations, but a first striking uh, result is that we only get 10% of Dune cases. So um, it, it appears to be the case that Latin, one of the two verbs, is, 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 is massively dominant anyway in, in the data. So if there is something we can explain, it, it, it already a priori, it's not going to be very much because Latin is so very much present in the data anyway. Um, now, if we look, so what I can do now informally is to have a look at the various results. And I'm going to go over the various factors and see whether what we find corresponds to the original hypothesis of, or not. So what we find for construction type is that in contrast with the intransitive condition, transitives boost, they foster the presence of, of Latin. With regard to animacy, we find that inanimate matrix subjects, so inanimate subjects in, in, on the highest level of the sentence, massively promote doom, support the presence of doom. The example here is the wind made him shiver. Okay, that's an inanimate subject, and date, that's the past tense of doom. Country, going to the lectal factors. So I'm mentioning, um, I'm mentioning the factors in the order in which they are taken up by the statistical pro process, right? So that means that construction type, the first one, explains, uh, is, is the highest factor to explain the variation we have. Um, animacy is the second factor. The third factor is country. So lectal variation does play a role. Belgian Dutch has more doon than Netherlandic Dutch. Register plays a role. The majority of non-spontaneous prepared texts significantly support doon. So if you look at the registers in the corpus, we see that there is stylistic or lectal variation. And the collocational measures also seem to have an effect in the following sense that and this is a quite interesting pattern. Significant conceptual collocation. So if you have a conceptual collocational measure that is significantly high, then we see that it promotes Latin. That is to say, in informal terms, the more a verb is typically used in a causative construction, the more Latin is used. That is to say, to put it very simplistically, Latin is the default verb for a causative construction. That's also confirmed by the fact that, so, that you have so many Latins in, 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 pure, in, in the sense of raw statistics, raw frequencies. But on the other hand, lexical collocation seems to favor Dune. Uh, some verbs typically, if there are verbs that typically associate with one uh, infinitive, then the causal auxiliary is more often Dune than Latin. So, it seems to be that as a more or less marked form, given the predominance of Latin, Dune is somewhat of a lexical exception. Okay, so these are the factors that appear to be important. What's the success that we get with this type of model? Well, of course, 
If we have no model at all, we already know that we have 90% uh, chance of finding Latin because that's the raw frequency, right? That's the basic distribution. To, so to do better than that, to do better than 90%, uh, you don't have a lot of opportunity to do better than 90%. Still, the best model we get uh, with, with the statistical te techniques gets, gives us an improvement from 90% to 95% of accuracy. So that's still quite a significant, quite a relevant increase. So we can be happy with this model. We can say, yes, we can see that actually something extra is explained that we cannot explain when we simply say Latin is the default case and that gives us a, a, a good prediction in 90% of cases. So it's a strong and reliable model. There are other statistical measures that you can use to, to establish this, but let me not bore you with those. Then we uh, compared, so we have the, the, this is the model. These are the factors that come out of uh, an analysis of the total material, Belgian, Dutch, and Atlantic Dutch together. But now, of course, we have a, a, a very interesting question, namely, suppose that we separate the two, the two corpora. Are the statistical models that we get the same? Because by looking at the two, the two subcorpora together, we might be misleading ourselves. We might think that there is one set of factors that influences uh, the, the, the presence of Duno Lathan, but okay, we do, and we find that lectal variation, that, that the difference, regional variation, the difference between, uh, between the North and the South, between Netherlands Dutch and Belgian Dutch, plays a role in this case. We've seen it as one of the factors. So what happens if we do a separate analysis of the, uh, of the two uh, things? Suppose that we find that the factors that are relevant in one region are totally different from the factors that are relevant in the other region. Then you can say we have two separate systems, right? Netherlandic Dutch is a separate system from Belgian Dutch. On the other hand, if the factors are largely the same, then we can say, okay, it's just a question of degree, of a difference of degree rather than a difference of, of system, if you wish. And actually, what we find is this. The overall model, so if we separate them, so a model in this case is the set of factors that are statistically significant in the regression analysis. Okay. Um, the set of factors are the same, and the order in, of inclusion in the factors in the model, so as I said, in a stepwise logistic regression, the order of inclusion is relevant. The order is also the same. So this model, construction, animacy, um, significant uh, collocation, significant semantic collocation, and significant lexical collocation, that is, this, uh, oh yes, and comp is, is component, right? That's the stylistic register. The same factors, the same registers, the, the, the same order. So it's a question of a difference of degree, not a question of really separate systems. Um, there are a few, a few uh, differences that might be uh, interesting, but let me just go over this quickly. An interesting one is that the effect of the collocation measures is more outspoken in Netherlandic Dutch than in Flemish, than in Belgian Dutch. Um, that is to say, if you have this lexical collocation or semantic collocation, that factor has a greater impact in the, North, in the Netherlandic Dutch part and in the uh, Belgian Dutch part. I, I'm, I will come back to the interpretation of these effects. So let's summarize what we find and, and then go to a further interpretation. So the default form, course, the default form for causatives is Latin. And to the extent that the more typically causative a construction is, the more readily it uses, uh, it uses Latin. We've seen that. Latin is the default case, and it's a default case specifically also with the default causatives or causative constructions. Dun is a marked form. And it's triggered by constructional factors like inanimacy of the matrix subject or intransitivity of the verb. And it can also be triggered by lexical collocations. From a lectal point of view, Dune is more formal 
given its distribution over the registers that we find, than Latin. And the, re the restrictions on the use of Doon are less outspoken in Netherlandic Dutch, in, uh, sorry, in Belgian Dutch and Flemish than in Netherlandic Dutch. So that's the basic, the basic observation here. Okay, but what does this tell us about hypothesis testing? Because we have this hypothesis about direct and indirect causation. What is left of our direct, indirect causation hypothesis? Um, well, the direct, indirect causation hypothesis is clearly not completely adequate. A majority of the predictions that we started off with is simply not confirmed. So we can give an overview. We predicted that intransitivity would disfavor Latin. That's not correct. Uh, intransitivity would favor Dune, but that seems to be somewhat correct. Um, Coreferentiality would favor Dune, that's not the case, and so on, and so on. So most of the predictions that we derived from the initial model, model that we started with, are not correct. We have reason to believe that the initial hypothesis is probably not a very best one. To the extent that semantic factors are involved, um, they're of a different kind than what is pre predicted and what is said by the, uh, trans by the direct indirect uh, causation hypothesis. Also, uh, another question that we should take into account or that we should discuss, um, to what extent are Dune and Latin synonymous? Well, they are both causative auxiliaries, but we can see that there is quite a bit of variation in the choice of one over the other. They do not. The choice, bet the, the choice between the two would be of the kind that interested us yesterday if it would only be lectal factors, that ex what we here call external factors, that distinguish between the two. But as you can see, it is not only external factors. It's also other factors. So that makes it difficult to use the uh, alternation, the variation between Dune and Latin for the type of study that we uh, illustrated yesterday with clothing terms and football terms. Right? Okay. Those are quite important, discussion, quite important conclusions. Right? We can see that we have a method here for maybe establishing... Uh, strict synonymy, and this is not a case of that. It is no pure semantic denotational synonymy with only lectal variation between the items, first. Second thing, we can also see that it is possible to, ref to um, employ, to use standard forms of hypothesis testing on lexical and semantic materials. So we're left with, with, with one more question now. Do we have an alternative hypothesis for the time being, one that would seem to fit better with the observations that we've made and one that could be used for further testing because that's the way it goes in scientific inquiry. You go from, up from a theory to observations to a refutation of the theory or a modification of the theory and then to more observations and testing and so on. So do we have another one? Yes, I want to present one, namely that Dune is essentially an archaic form, a form that is on its way out in the language. Because most of the phenomena that, uh, that we seem to find, most of the obs observations that we can make, fit in with the idea that Dune is, a f is an older form, a for an, uh, let me call it an archaic form. Archaic forms, so first, archaic forms are usually typical for formal registers. You wouldn't find the archaisms in the informal registers. That's where you find the, the innovation. Second, uh, when a form goes out of the language, it usually stays in the language, but in very restricted circumstances. So if we find lexical collocations with Dune, lexical associations, that's also something that could point to the fact that the free use of Dune is disappearing and that, is, that it is becoming more and more a, um, not entirely, but that it is becoming more and more a lexically fixated form, an idiomatic form. 
Third, the fact that Doon occurs more in Belgian Dutch may also point out to its archaic uh, st status because as you know already, we, we, we discussed that earlier, the standardization of, of, Dutch, of, of Belgian Dutch came later than the standardization of Netherlandic Dutch. So the older forms of the language in which Doon was still more freely used, the older forms of the language would be found more in Belgian Dutch. To put it simplistically, Belgian Dutch, uh, well, let me not say that, that it's still acting uh, as if we were still in the Middle Ages, but in general terms, you could say something like that. The stage of the language that you find in Belgian Dutch might be slightly older than the stage of the language that you find in Netherlandic Dutch. And then we do get a semantic effect, so all of the things that I'm saying now, uh, that I was saying now, are not really semantic factors, but there is a bit of a semantic factor. Um, a semantic factor in, in the sense that in archaisms you also may tend to get a restriction to a very specific meaning. So there is something that, if, if there is something left of the direct causation hypothesis, it would be that uh, Dune expresses direct material causation with inanimate subjects. Certainly not direct causation with animate subjects, on the contrary. So that type of, of uh, semantic restriction might also be an, uh, an indication of the archaic nature of, of the Dune formation. So uh, when we have that, there are some further steps that we would be taking, but uh, I'm not going to in go into that for the sake of time and also because I've already mentioned that we are developing this in, into uh, an, 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 uh, uh, an even more extended study by taking in more materials and taking, taking in more factors to code in the coding schema. So let me just skip over that and come to conclusions. First, um, bottom-up co corpus-based analysis where you take your corpus and try to analyze what you find in the corpus pay off. If you have schematic and only vaguely substantiated, not substantiated, substantiated hypothesis, of a direct indirect causation type hypothesis that you think of by leaning back, that you think about by leaning back in your armchair. Those can be tested, but you should go beyond that, and you should go beyond that by having a good look at the corpus data, and having a good look at it means trying to find objectifiable, operational, operationalizable correlates of your hypothesis in the corpus and then testing them. Um, second, that's a bit specific for causatives. They ex exhibit some constructional phenomena on the con uh, conceptual level and on the lexical level. That's a conclusion that's not so important from our point of view. In the context of this series of lect lectures, what is very important is that lectal variation again seems to play an important role in the construction of the language, in this case in the choice for Dune or Latin. And lectal variation in this case is not just in terms of region, Netherlandic Dutch and Belgian Dutch, but also in terms of register. In the example here, spontaneous versus prepared sources. So to conclude, but that was already clear to you who followed the rest of the lectures, we do need a lectally enriched multifactorial corpus grammar as part of cognitive sociolinguistics. Thank you. <laughs>